what is NES. What is NES is a very educative program on GTV, the authentic and trusted voice of Ghana. What is NES is a program that is asking questions about contemporary challenges confronting us as a nation. But in the process, we look for people we consider to be people with accumulated wisdom. We get closer to them on our platform and ask them how to help us find some relevant answers to such questions. And today, just by grace, we are meeting a man of many parts to help us respond to the challenge of our, our media and public decency, media and public decency in our country at the moment. And the man I'm talking about has been a former principal of our campus of the University of Development Studies. By the moment, he is the Director General of Ghana Broadcasting Corporation. I'm talking about Professor Amin Alasa. Prof, I don't know who is welcoming who, but somebody <laughs> must be welcome. Definitely. So you are welcome, you are welcome to what is next. Thank you very much. I'm very <laughs> excited to be on this show. I've watched it often, and I've always looked at it to be a place for a lot of things to learn. Happy to hear Thank that. Thank you. Now, Prof, should getting the public to follow acceptable moral standards be an integral concern of media houses? To, to a large extent, yes. If you look at the, uh, even from the st standpoint of normative theory of media, the justification for the legal framework under which media is defined in a democracy, especially in a republic, that function is considered an integral part of the work of the media. The media has the responsibility of moderating as a moderator of public decency, decorum. The media has a responsibility of making sure that what is acceptable is out there in the public domain. And I think that, yes, it is true. And we should uh, particularly look at the very foundation, the reason why democracy, as we know it today, has provided that privileged space for media. The legal protections, the constitutional provisions that have been provided to ensure that the media is protected to perform its work. It is supposed to be a medium. A public space is supposed to mediate between various forces of society. And for that, normatively, the mass media or any form of media, insofar as it enjoys these legal and constitutional provisions, has that responsibility of ensuring that public morality is moderated and mediated in a way that is acceptable to society. Mm. But that also brings a lot of other issues that we can talk about. Okay. Yes. And, and like you said, the media set the tone and temperature for public discussion and orientation. Now, in your estimation, how has the media set the tone for matters of public decency in Ghana? How conscious even are our media personnel and the various media houses on this major media responsibility as you just touched on? I think uh, let's first understand that the media, the media workers are not to become the spokesperson of this morality. Mm -hmm. It's a medium. They are supposed to seek out voices that I can call guardians of morality. They are supposed to look out to um, even moral entrepreneurs in moments of conflict of values where, let's take the issue of, uh, let's say, gay and lesbian issues in the country, they have the responsibility of seeking out moral entrepreneurs who can articulate reasons for this or that. But the media worker himself, the journalist himself, need not necessarily become the voice. Mm. He is the medium through which others participate in public discourse. And this position of the media is derived from the 18th century concept of the public sphere, the mass media 
represents the public space in which contending citizens' voices are mediated and moderated to arrive at a certain consensus for policy action. So on, the, on that score, the media worker is not necessarily supposed to be the voice, but he's supposed to facilitate various voices in a way that certain people are not over advantage over the other and make sure that everybody is given the space to share in this public discourse that will arrive at a certain moral value system for the society. And that is what the media is supposed to do. You, you said that the journalists or the media personnel must do their work in such a way that they don't give, is it undue advantage? Yes. yes. Prof, please, will you look straight into this camera and talk to Ghanaian media personnel this issue that you have just touched on? Well, I think, first of all, to do that, let's first of also be very frank with our system. Mm. Every society gets the media it deserves. Every society gets the media it deserves. Sure. The media we have didn't come from anywhere. We created it ourselves. The spaces, look, listen, we have one of the best constitutional provisions that protects the media. Mm. If you read our, every time I read those provisions, I feel very proud as a Ghanaian that our constitution provides enough provisions to protect the media space to function. But what do, after we got this, what do we do? We, as citizens, must stand up and ensure that the right thing is done. Who are dominating the public space? What voices are we hearing? Mm. So if you want to look at and say the media, the journalists, I will let us say the owners of the media, mm. who are not journalists, who determine who can speak and who cannot speak, we will speak to them. This is where the issue remains, that as a nation, we've collectively agreed and allowed this system to run. And we should collectively take responsibility for it. And if we want to fix it, then we don't just have to target the message to the journalists on the screen talking or writing the newspaper columns. But we have to ask ourselves, how do we ensure that the constitutional provisions that we have actually end up to the benefit of this wonderful system we call a republic of citizens. Mm. And the, the, the whole idea, if you, if, you, if you look into the literature, you trace it back to, like I said earlier, to the 18th century of concept of public sphere. Once it became very clear that society could not be mediated by uh, coffee houses and meeting points and marketplaces, there's supposed to be a particular public space which was considered to be where people would share ideas. Let's not forget that the media never started as that. The, the, the newspapers we had started as commercial merchant news, uh, information sharing space. So the idea that journalism has come to perform this function is a particular transformation that occurred as society became complicated, complex. And I think once we come to this understanding, then we ask ourselves, are there provisions for them to operate? Yes, we have some of the best provisions in the world in Ghana. Then we have to say, when we come to actualize it, are we doing it? Mm -hmm. There are two types of media, mm -hmm. principally, that you have to pay attention to. Media as a public space for critical discourse about society leading to policy formulation. Or media as a commercial medium mm -hmm. with the primary responsibility of harvesting eyeballs and attention to be sold to advertisers to the highest bidder. Now these two can sometimes come and convey in one institution. But principally, when you examine every uh, media system, you can tell that, look, this is more about commerce and harvesting eyeballs. So it operates more in the attention economy. Mm. Then this, you look at this and you say, oh, this is more a public-oriented medium, like GPC does. There are a few other, uh, you have, for example, other TV stations in the country we have which are focused on in opening a public space for discourse. Then we have those who are clear, clearly set up in the attention economy. Their job is to attract attention. Mm -hmm. From childhood, one of the things human beings have mastered is the art of seeking attention. The baby will cry to attract attention. 
when he grows up, he will play pranks to attract attention. Media in the space called attention economy must generate attention. Whatever method they will use to ensure that you go to the channel or you click to their website, they will. In the process, the strategies they adopt do not help our democratic development. Mm. It's about the money. It's not about citizens' capacity. Mm. So these two types of media we have to ask, which one do we prefer to mainstream in this country? What we have seen in recent years is a gradual erosion of media that operates as public space to media that operates as attention economy in the business of harvesting eyeballs and clicks for the highest bidder in order to generate advertising. These two distinctions we need to create and ask ourselves as Ghanaian, what do we want to do? Do we want, in the end, the public-oriented media to start moving commercial and becoming completely uh, commerce-oriented? And here you will understand why even the most developed democracies like the UK, like Germany, like Denmark, Sweden, Finland, the one of the, when you go to these environments, the largest media systems they have are public not private. Mm. Even till today, the BBC, the Dutch Veles are consistently very dominant media systems in their environment and they are publicly funded, not commerce. Mm -hmm. And maybe, you know, there is a growing phenomenon in Ghanaian media as, as you are raising the issue. Almost all the media houses do newspaper reviews in the morning. And they are done by regular participation of representatives of the two major political parties full of uh, phoning and then advert. Dr. Tony Otinjesi has admonished on this platform that there's a need for a paradigm shift. You seem to agree with that position, but where do we start? Absolutely, I agree with him. Look. Let us be very, very frank. In media work, media production, when you run a media for profit, you want to, like every entrepreneur, you want to invest less and harvest more. Newspaper review, phone-ins, are very cheap to produce in the media business. You don't invest much money to spend one hour or two hours doing newspaper review, and then you get some two political parties to come and start George or each other because they have interest too in terms of seeking people's attention. And then you spend the two hours there, people also come in and then say and you do advertisement. It is cheap to produce. And if it can bring the eyeballs, a good media entrepreneur will prefer that. But a good media manager who is public oriented will invest in content creation. And when you are to invest in content creation, it's obvious that uh, you are not going to waste time and let people just call in and call in and call in and then speak and speak and speak and then the time is over. Rather, there is preparation. Next week, what you'll be doing on this day, you've already started putting money, investing in how to get the best content. Even if somebody is in Kumasi, you've already arranged how the fellow will come over or how he will link up. If you have to do some research and bring out very relevant information, you will commission a properly trained academic who can do the research and give you the information you need. Today, media houses hardly have research departments. Um, truth, we told GBC hasn't been left out in this decline towards the market. And as a result, we, like to, we have been going towards the cheaper way of produ produ producing content. But a very expensive media content will include commissioned research work, relevant authorities, no matter where they are, you get them on board, and they will speak to the issues and link it to the past and project it into the future and help the citizen to understand the complexity of issues. Mm -hmm. I'll just uh, give you an example. And uh, it was very sad that uh, when uh, institutions themselves are no more prepared to invest in to speak for themselves. In the same way media organizations have tended not to invest in, in terms of creating the relevant content. 
the cost of producing a very good content of, on BBC is very high. Why? Because they source the money through TV license and they use the money to invest and the content, when you listen to the content, you will like it. It's not cheap. Mm -hmm. Now, if they want to do cheap production, they open the phone lines and everyone will call in. So I said earlier that every society gets the media they deserve, yeah. precisely because if you refuse to understand how public-oriented media, not only GBC, but any other private media that is public-oriented, is funded and operates, and you leave them to market, they are going to move towards the cheaper way of producing content, and the citizens will be poorly educated. The democracy will be, this institutional democracy we are building up will be the, uh, will have, mm -hmm. it will have a negative impact on it, and that is where we are. We are. So, um, newspaper reviews have become the uh, logical step when media entrepreneurs want to take out a lot and invest less. And for the public funded ones, because of poor funding, they have also ended up moving towards that direction. That is where we are. A paradigm shift must occur, but we can't just wish it. We have to ask ourselves, what do we need to put in place to ensure that the media organizations that we expect to do the right thing do it? My own GBC, we were well, think. Uh, when I was a reporter here, we had a research department. There was a research office just by the newsroom. And they were full-time staff, just walk in and ask them, three years ago, the budget was read, what they'll give, pull it out and help you, and all that. Today, we are not doing that. Because we have had a lot of staff attrition. We are not able to maintain research units to help feed content, our content. And so the quality of discourse in our democracy is poor. One example I will check and I will show it to you, tell you. Take the recent discussions on the MPs car loans. If we really had taken our time to understand how we arrive at the car loans, we would have allowed it to be there. Mm. Because the alternative means that the taxpayer will pay more. There is no two ways about that the car loan system was arrived at because the alternative was to provide like we provide for other uh, um, other state employees in that category certain conditions of service and if we are to provide a fueled vehicle with a driver to be maintained at the cost of the state for the four-year term of the MP I would tell you that Anytime you buy a corporate vehicle and you service it for three years, you would have spent an equivalent amount the original cost of the vehicle on the servicing. Three years, not four. By the third year, insurance, maintenance, servicing, the driver's salary, everything, when you compute all of it, it will buy you another V8. So what we used to get from the MPs was actually a very cheap arrangement where it was better for we, us we are here to hear this voice on this conversation yes, from your end because well we are here to hear because well i don't work in the newsroom i'm the director general and okay. i manage gpc and your friends are in the no and the don't, newsroom i don't interfere in editorial affairs it's very important that the director general of gpc stays away okay. from influencing editorial content and i've maintained this hmm. I only interfere when there are unethical practices that I have observed, then I'll draw their attention to it. But where they do their work, I don't, I will never bother to influence how the uh, editorials, the headlines are written. No, I will never do that. That is not my responsibility. Mm -hmm. So we should, uh, I mean, well, even when I can criticize my newsroom. Mm. Yes, they all got it wrong. We, and that is because, and this is where I come in, I have failed to invest in the newsroom because I don't have the resources that would have allowed them to understand that the debate on car loans for MPs was arrived at following a certain conversation at the dawn at the beginning of this our democracy at the earlier stages of the constitution of uh, 1992 constitution that discussion was on 
and it was considered to be the most economical way where the cost of maintaining the vehicle will be shared between I and mean, will be held taken on by the MP. Mm -hmm. But if we now have to provide them four wheel, maintain them, by the third year we would have bought two V8s. We would have got an additional cost of spending another cost of V8 on it. And so I think that there's, there are a lot of issues that come for discussion. And the quality of the discussion tells you that we don't seem to learn from the past. How did we arrive at car loans for MPs? We should have asked that question. The answers are there in the parliamentary mm. records. You can find out what was the original debate and how did they arrive at this. I would absolutely wish that we maintain the car loans for the MPs mm. to save the pressure on the national economy. Okay. Now that we are going for abolishing it, taxpayers should be ready to carry a more serious burden. Viewers, this is what is next. And I'm in conversation with uh, Professor Amin Alassan, the Director General of Ghana Broadcasting Corporation. And he is drawing attention to death, research, content, that our media houses must not just focus on uh, attracting the eyeballs, getting the attention, things that will push the market. He's not condemning that, that somebody must get money, but then he's saying that if we don't do it well, then we'll end up getting the media uh, that we deserve. But if we can direct attention to research and get death in the content, we will do ourselves a lot of good. Prof, now there's this um, Brockerson bill. And let me find out from you. Will, you, will it serve as a game changer? Will it change anything? What is in the broadcaster bill that will reposition the media for us to get the decency that we all deserve, that we are calling for? I think that uh, the bill by itself has been very late in coming. We should have had this 20 years ago. And if you look into the African scene, 20 years ago, I mean, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Ghana, were all thinking of this broadcasting bill. They passed years into law. We failed to pass our years into law. It is very important and very interesting that the current uh, Ministry of Information has taken up the issue seriously and is pushing for the bill to be passed into law. And I think we have to commend the Ministry for that. That is an excellent job. However, we also have to accept the fact that the content of the bill as it is, which was conceptualized 20 years ago, the, the, the media ecology has changed drastically in ways that we really have to do fundamental changes in the broadcasting bill to reflect the media scene today. 20 years ago, the analog was very strong, digital was just emerging. Today, analog is dead, digital is all over. 20 years ago, it was possible to say that you can control all the TV channels that Ghanaians can see as a state. Today, there are three platforms before internet. There are three platforms. We have cable, which you don't have at all in Ghana. Then we have the digital terrestrial television, DTT. And the third one is the satellite. The recent trend we are seeing in Ghana is that Ghanaians are more towards satellite as against the DTT in terms of accessing the same content. What does that mean? It simply means that I can sit in Nigeria, set up a TV station, and target the Ghanaian market. And Ghanaian TV sets will get me. But I don't need I will fall outside the regulatory ambit of the state of Ghana. So increasingly, from the African point of view, continental point of view, broadcasting laws should go beyond the state in terms of linking up to other, a, a continental framework. Mm. So African countries will need to set up a continental framework on regulating broadcasting. So that if it's possible, 
you sit in Gambia and you are targeting the Ghanaian market, Ghana should be able to inform the Gambian state to put pressure and make sure that if you are abusing or breaking the Ghanaian rules and laws, we'll be able to take you to task. Mm. So it's perfectly possible to sit outside the country and target the Ghanaian market with content that is against Ghanaian law. And this is a problem. The new broadcasting bill will have to respond to that challenge. Uh, the draft as it is, I haven't seen it in there, but it has to respond to that challenge. Mm -hmm. Then, I mean, there's also the issue that the type of TV sets that we are getting in the market today are called smart TVs, meaning that you can switch between DTT satellite to the internet seamlessly just with the remote control. And that also brings a whole new dimension to the complexity of media regulation. So I think that we need to go back and rethink a lot of the issues that are fundamental to regulatory reg to media regulation mm -hmm. and see how we can put some sanity into it. It's quite disturbing that um, the TV in my house, my kids can just take the remote and switch from uh, regular TV to internet seamlessly without me knowing. And what content are they going to get? Mm -hmm. And I think uh, on this call, we should. 20 years ago, GBC engineers were baffling with this very idea. I came across some content discussions by the fact that we have to define what type of TV sets are allowed into the market. But the policymakers then said that it was not easy to implement, so it was abandoned. So now that we have an open market for TV sets, the TV sets that are coming into the market today are more than TV sets, they are computer devices in the form of TVs, and the content regulating it is a challenge. Are we aware of this? Oh, we are aware, of course. If you, I mean, I mean, I mean not people like you. Yes, but that's any device that comes, in, in including a policymaker. Any communication device that enters the Ghanaian market comes through the right channel, and we have standards. Uh, is it Ghana Standards uh, Authority? Mm -hmm. Authority. Mm -hmm. Then we have the Ministry of Communication rules and regulations about devices that can be brought into the country. So yes, this, this is just that we have been late in thinking through these issues. So today, I think I would say that it's a challenge we have to come together and tackle. Mm -hmm. That TV has changed beyond our imagination. It's no more that box. It's indeed a tube that connects beyond the nation. Mm. Interesting. Now, Prof, you are not only Director General at GBC, you are an academic, you are a professor, you are into communication, you are a consultant in communication. At what point can broadcasting be indecent? <sighs> well, it's a moral question, and I think that uh, it is something we arrive at through a consensus. There is no blueprint to say this is this and this is. Decency is something that shifts. If you watch over time, every society redefines what is decent over time. And I think that that is why the media is supposed to engage voices that will help define the uh, the, the boundaries of decency for media consumption. And I think that to define what is decent and indecent will be a very complicated matter. But rather to say that how, what is the concept of decency as we speak today? Some years ago, the mere ability to even talk about gay and lesbian would have earned you something different from what we have today. And today, some people are struggling to have the voice to speak. Now, um, it is quite what today passes for decency 50 years in the past would never have been allowed. So there, there's a shifting, there's a process where at every milieu, society helps to define what is decent. And the media rather than being those who define the media, creates the space for moral voices and moral entrepreneurs to engage in a discourse that will define the boundaries. Mm. That is the whole idea. Mm. So any attempt to say this is this, this is, this is, from my point of view, I would say, no, I would say, look, 
let us see if it is movies what does the uh, uh, national film classification says about this movie and at this time then we obey, then we obey it maybe time to come they will revise the classification system and then we will we'll, we'll, we'll do it mm. there has been some attempt recently if you watch in the media scene for example once the uh, the Ghana uh, standards authority enforced the time that you can advertise uh, certain types of content on television we saw that those uh, alcohol beverages the adverts have shifted during the day from television to online <laughs> I don't know what the Ghana Standards Authority will say about online content. But if my phone, a smartphone, can give me the same content you have banned on television until after 8 p.m. or 9 p.m., what is the use? So we, should, we need to open up these discussions beyond this idea that television, you, we say we shouldn't, uh, we should not do the content, uh, any advert on alcohol beverages during the daytime. Fine, we'll, we'll obey. But if I set up a website and I'm carrying the same content, I will continue doing those, uh, the, those uh, content for anybody to watch. And the question then is, does it really matter whether it's online or it's on television? Because the television that has arrived in the house does not discriminate between television of old and the internet content. Mm -hmm. It seamlessly transitions between the two. Mm -hmm. And these are issues that we have to discuss as a country mm -hmm. and ask ourselves, can we rethink some of the issues of regulatory issues that we talk about? Then soon we realize that we need a, an ECOWAS region framework. Then very soon we realize that we need an African Union framework to try to... Re Once you have an African Union framework, the voice will be very formidable enough to be able to stop some of these things and regulate them, even if they are not within your jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And these are possibilities. But once we set our mind to them, we'll be able to achieve. Mm -hmm. Interesting. But Prof, in an environment of propaganda, exaggerations, over politicization, how do we maintain values such as factual, truthful, accuracy, decency media? Uh, look at it this way. We have the digital media out there, like a well file. A lot of startups have started their websites and they've learned that the more people click on your website, the more you are going to harvest revenue in US dollars. Mm. And Google AdSense will send the money into your accounts. And it's good money, I must tell you. AdSense revenue is, is, is the biggest thing in the media today. But how do you get it? Just by getting people to click on your website. So if you pull a prank and just doctor anything and put it out there, like this morning somebody sent forward to me, uh, Jacob Zuma, who is in prison mm -hmm. in the South Africa, in a prison suit, and I zoomed it and looked at it and I said, oh no, this is fake. Mm. It's fake. And it's all over the place. It's all over the place, but it's fake. So, fakery has become a, a whole economy itself. The whole idea is to get you to click on the website and see the picture. And he would have scored a few US cents in his, in his account, mm -hmm. that website. So, what we are experiencing today, actually, my one of my favorite uh, uh, philosophers Jean Baudrillard in the 1980s at the early dawn of digital technology had predicted that in the new digital economy that is emerging the fake will be more real than the real mm. so he talks about the fake will be more real than the real than the real and because are we there how close oh, are we, we have, there we have passed there we are there deeply there deeply there I mean, one of the things that I used to do in Montreal, when, I mean, Montreal, when I was teaching at Concordia University before I moved to, Montreal has a street called St. Jacques, and all these American movies come there to shop. So I will give an assignment to first year students to go to St. Jacques Street and 
see their favorite movie star. Mm -hmm. Be it Oprah Winfrey, be it whatever you see, Denzel Washington. Just see them face to face and come and give us your experience. Mm -hmm. One thing you will hear from all the students was when they saw them face to face, they preferred the picture <laughs> than the person. <laughs> they look different. Uh -huh. So the movie you have been watching, you have now assumed that to be the real. And when you are confronted with the real, you run back to the copy. And the copy now is more important than the original. And this concept that Jane Borea talked about, he was a deep philosopher, he talked deeply about these issues. Then over time we found that these things are unraveling before us. But our language, the meta language as a metaphor, is far behind in understanding it. If I give you a sheet of paper to go and make a photocopy, or I give you a photo of myself to go and do some photoshopping and make it look better, and when you finish that, the finished product will be better than the copy, than the original. And that concept has been translated in our everyday media consumption habits. Fake news travels faster because people like to believe in it. Even when later the correct news emerges, they live in denial and they want to believe the fake news. Like I just told you about Jacob Zuma's photo. Today, if I want to tell people that it's fake, they don't mind me because the fake is better and more real than. I mean, that is what we have reached. And there's a, very, uh, there's a lot of work done in this area in terms of helping us understand what we are going through. So in this circumstance, media outlets that propagate lies are likely to get more attention than media organizations that will take their time and prevent the tr present the truth. Because remember I said earlier, the attention economy is with us. Mm -hmm. And if you tell the truth, you don't get their attention, you need to pull a prank and get their attention, increase your revenue, and laugh your way to the bank. So there's a whole industry in fakery, and it has just emerged. How do we regulate it? There are a few laws in the system mm -hmm. that helps us to understand that fake news will come with a penalty. Uh, how many people have been punished? The how many people are when prof from where you said uh, not only GBC but oh, yes, uh, especially yes, yes. we were specialists in communication. Yes. How do you see media education in this country? Now the local languages, people are going to farm, they go with their mobile phone or their wireless mm -hmm. set mm -hmm. and all that. And so people are consuming what you are talking about. But how are we doing the media enlightenment and mm -hmm. education I think for people to be aware that well, you see uh, Zuma, Jacob Zuma, but you haven't seen him yet? Mm -hmm. Who is doing that at the moment? Well, that responsibility should fall on the, our educational system. One of the things that you will observe that differentiates us from the some developing countries like the Canadian system, I'm very much used to it, used to it because I haven't uh, taught in the Canadian system for more than 10 years, is the fact that they've taken serious interest in media education at the basic education level. At the basic education, they were aware that we are going to go into this economy of fakery and that they need to prepare their citizens towards that. So that distinction is a skill you have to build among from kindergarten through to so that once you, 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 you see fake, you will identify it and pass it for amusement, but you will not act on it. Even spread it. People spread are sharing. I mean, it is easy to cause chaos by spreading fake news. And after there's a riot, and people are probably maimed or died, they will not realize that the original story was fake. But if you prepare the citizens from the educational curriculum to let them appreciate that we live in uh, information society, media is with us, it won't go away. We need to prepare from basic education to university some media literacy content in Prof, our career. Please, please, talk to some. We don't know, we may not know who is watching us, but 
what you have just mentioned to me, look straight into somebody's eyes and raise this issue for this country. Who knows? Well, I think, let us be honest, the Ghana Education Service needs to set up. Increase content on media literacy from basic education through to secondary school. And universities must understand that media literacy is not a luxury. It is, should be a required course so that that graduate you are producing, when he comes out to take a responsible position, he will be able to make a distinction between fake and real. And it's very easy at the same time to confirm fake. Once you know how to confirm fake, when you get it, you will know what to do. I can sit here, you send me something, I'll use my phone and confirm that it's fake, and I'll relax. So once we are able to let the citizens understand, then fakery will no more be rewarding. Mm -hmm. But as we sit today, in the media buying and selling business, faking is one of the sources of increasing your revenue very fast and quick. AdSense revenue, like I keep saying, why as a CEO of GBC, when you get revenue in AdSense, it comes in US dollars. And when you when they print it out, you will smile. They, of course, the other revenue is in cities, so you can tell why I say it's good money. So if GBC was not a morally bound organization, and my job was to lead GBC to just make money, I will set up a team that will develop what we call a lot of click clickbaits to bait people to click and we will get a lot of revenue but it's not a moral mm. revenue but if i were to run a private media establishment i would definitely be doing that because i have a responsibility to increase revenue and declare profits so my counterparts in other smaller media organizations are doing just that and their revenue is actually going up if you care to understand why it is interesting to be in that business is that 2021 is the first time that expenditure on adverts the digital has taken 50 percent mm. last year it was about 2021 we now have if you take the whole of kangana and you take the total amount of advertising expenditure by companies and industries and you put it together 50 percent of it will be spent online Traditional media, we are accounting for about 27%. So the TV stations, the radio stations are competing for 27% of the pie. But digital media now commands 50% as of this year, 2021. And that simply means that the industry is going to grow. Faking to attract people to come and read your content will be growing. And what also makes it interesting is that those who do it, can run can get away with murder in the sense that even to catch them is a problem when we were having the presidential petition in parliament and the conversation was around and you know at some point the chief justice justifiably got angry about the media what was true is that all the content that were offensive did not come from traditional media they came from online platforms. When you go back to look at our constitutional provisions, all those general provisions to insulate the media, when the crafters of our constitution were doing that, they did not have social media in mind. They were thinking about a media establishment with a return address, meaning that if the Ghanaian Times publishes something, I know where to locate Ghanaian mm. Times office. And so it gave us the right to rejoin that, oh. which is ensuring the constitution. And I think that the assumption was that you can always locate where the content is coming from. The GBC is at Kanda, you can, we can't run away. So we won't do anything, but you can always come and get us. So the assumption was that media is an established institution in a democratic system, in a republic. Today we have a media where you can't even locate where it is. But its ability, to spread falsehood is on might.
So we need to come back to a conversation and ask ourselves, what type of regulatory system are we going to put in place which will respond to this challenge? This is What is Next on GBC, the authentic and trusted voice of Ghana. I am in conversation with the Director General of Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, and he is admonishing that we must be very careful as a nation that we don't reward people who are pushing fake news. And he is encouraging that those who are in charge of educational curriculum in this country, maybe from the basic to the tertiary, must seriously consider a, a, a media literacy, media education, enlightenment, so that Ghanaians will be able to decipher, discern the difference. Because if we don't take care, such fake news can cause harm. Prof, now the media is expected to reflect public realities. Is it possible for the media to reflect decency when actually the reality in the public space is indecent? It is possible because... Well, it is possible in the traditional media. One of the distinctions of the traditional media for which there was a need to protect it in the Constitution was the fact that there's a gatekeeping process where an editor with a lot of responsibility on his head determines what should pass and what should not pass because some content would be considered to be in bad taste. Despite everything, media can still, despite all these technological changes. When you live in a European society, one of the things that you will notice is that suicide is very high. But you will never get a report in a newspaper or television report on suicide. Because there's a general consensus mm. that the more you report suicide, the more it will increase. So despite all their democratic values, there's, a, there's an agreement that you don't report suicide. Unless it's a very high profile personality and the way you pass on will be something that we want to know. But on the average, suicide is not left out. We also have certain practices in our system where we have maintained that look, you cannot put something pornographic. But movie makers also know that porn tells and that by nature, humans are voyeuristic. We like to peek and see what we are not allowed to see. It's a human nature, like it or not. So sometimes they come to us to the edge as if they are going to give us some nakedness and then they take it away from us. But that's also the reason why film classification helps. We need to understand that content must be regulated. And I think that it is actually possible for the media as a gatekeeper, to keep out content that is not desirable. Where the media decides to break the bounds, the response of the society should bring it back into check. That means that every citizen has a responsibility to hold the media accountable for the boundaries of decency and morality that it establishes. And I think that is something that when I hear politicians blaming the media, I just laugh and I ask myself, come on, we did not give you that authority to sit there and blame the media. What policies have you put in place to ensure that this abuse doesn't okay? And this, I have a favorite story about the, the republic and media. And that comes from when the Americans were crafting their constitution and they, each day people came, therefore there was no electronic media the way we have today. So people actually converge to listen to, the, the, to wait until the deliberations when they come out and they'll ask them, what have you decided today? And there was a comment one of them said, when they finished finally and they decided that Americans want a republic can constitution and they should agree on it. They came out, one of them asked, so what have you decided? Then he said, a republic 
if you can keep it. Mm. Now, this is very important. A republic if you can keep it. In the Westminster democracy, there's a head of state in the form of the queen or the king. In a republic, the citizen is the king who must hold the office holder accountable. And that puts a lot of responsibility on the citizen. Now, if the media is misbehaving and you go along with it, then like I said earlier, you get the media you deserve. Mm. But the responsibility to hold the media accountable rests with the citizen. Prof, we would definitely <laughs> need to uh, continue this conversation uh, that they've given us the signal that we must stop somewhere. And we need more from you. So we will call you again to, to just come out of your, your office and it's a pleasure. help us it's educate a pleasure. Yeah. our people. But viewers, I have been in conversation with the Director General of Ghana Broadcasting Corporation. And he is saying that nations deserve the media that they work towards what it means what my i'm learning is if we don't want this media that is market driven giving profit to people but we want a media that is giving us the knowledge that will build this country then there's a need for a paradigm shift we will come your way same time next week god willing but until we meet again may god bless our homeland ghana Make this dear nation of ours great and strong. Please remember, COVID is still with us. My name is Kwabuna Opuni Frimpong. Have a very good evening.